Well, hello. Uh, my name is Judy Sleed, and uh, I miss Lee Davis, my director, who introduces me so beautifully. <laughs> and before I start saying anything, I also have to thank <coughs> Lupita, who came to my rescue so early in the morning and did my hair. So I'm here with <laughs> Ellen, and I'm so happy to have her. She's a very talented lady, pianist. How are you, Ellen? I'm fine today. How are you? I'm so happy to be sitting here relaxing with you. <laughs> it's been a very hectic morning. <laughs> and I heard you play, and I said, i got to have that lady on my show. I love the piano. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you have the same love for your piano. Well, I've been playing for, let's see, over... 45 years, so the piano has always been a big part of my life. So. And where was your first piano? Well, I started when I was, of course, um, about four or five, and my mother played the piano, and her sisters played the piano, and my grandmother was a piano teacher. So music was always around us, and um, I just thought it was a natural thing that we sang and danced and played piano. It was just every day for us. So you, your mother, your family taught you? Yeah, well, basically, uh, the music was always on our piano, and uh, my brothers took lessons, and I would always do their lessons. So they finally <laughs> figured out I should, should take lessons. So I started with a group piano teacher. At that time, it was unusual. And then moved to a, a wonderful uh, pianist on Long Island called Jenny Alessi who has long passed, but she was a, a prodigy from Curtis. And she was the one who gave me my starting training. She was a very good teacher. It's important to have a good teacher. Oh, yes, especially for piano. You, you need someone who's going to not only have a passion for the music, but they're always opening up new music for you to explore. Um, and they're very concerned that your technique is just so. And, and this one was... In, was particularly good. She had an amazing technique and just an amazing talent. So she shared all those wonderful things with me. And she was the one who uh, got me to audition for the Juilliard School. So I was able to go there when I was 15. So by the time you became 15, how, what did you play for the audition? Well, um, in our era, we, we have, all over New York, we have something called NISMA, the New York State Solo Music yes. Association. And there are six levels. And uh, when I grew up, I thought that each level was a grade. So in first grade, I did level one, yes. level two. And it didn't occur to me that for most students, you hit level six when you're in ninth, tenth grade. I hit it in sixth grade. So I was playing uh, Beethoven. I was playing... Uh, quite advanced pieces. So when I hit Juilliard, I believe I was playing a Bach Toccata in D minor, a Beethoven Sonata, and uh, I'm sure I, oh yes, I did a Chopin Polonaise, and I think I did the Cacciatorian Toccata. So this was quite a, a big program, and I was accepted at that time. So it was very exciting wow. to me. So after being with this uh, musical family and a teacher, then you went on to Juilliard to learn more. Well, yeah, Juilliard was a, a pre, of course, has the undergraduate and graduate. I had attended their pre-college program. So uh, although I lived on Long Island, I would take the Long Island Railroad every Saturday and go in for my theory, ear training, chorus, and uh, piano ensemble, as well as my lessons. And every week there was a uh, performance I would perform. And I did that for uh, three years. So it was oh, yeah. quite an arduous time. And um, it was very exciting because I met pianists from all over the world in those days. Um, most of the pianists that were going to the Juilliard pre-college were from New York or the metropolitan area. But there were many coming from Korea and Japan and from France. And so I got to meet this global Russia. community. Yeah, Russia was well represented too. <laughs> yeah. So I'm still stuck on that question that what else, after you know so much and you play so much, what can Juilliard offer that you haven't known, 
that you didn't know before. Well, that's interesting because Juilliard uh, is very strong on uh, developing the whole musician. Uh, so, but their, their band at that time was on performance. And by the time I was a, a high school graduate, I realized that, uh, well, that's all well and good, but there, it's harder to become a concert pianist than to be to go on a national football team. I mean, it's very, very difficult and arduous process. So I knew I needed something more. So at that time, I, I enrolled at Hofstra University, where I met a wonderful teacher named Blanche Abram, who was a master teacher in America. And she was much more clear in making music part of my whole life. As, as uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi said the other day, um, music is, is your fundamental passion. It's the thing that draws you through life. And everything you do is on the side. You know, if you, if you do <laughs> concertizing, if you do teaching, if you do any of those other things, but it's, it's great and it's wonderful if you're successful there. But the music is always the driving force. And I was lucky enough to find that teacher in college that, that put me in that direction. So. so were you born on Long Island? Oh, yes. I was, I've lived on Long Island my entire life, with the exception of uh, three years in Manhattan. But other than that, I've always lived on Long Island. And, and what have, part of Long Island? Well, I grew up in Lindenhurst. And mm -hmm. then uh, when I married uh, my husband, Howard, we lived in Manhattan for a time. And then we bought a house in Briarwood, which is right near Jamaica Estates. And I, oh, yes, that's a, a very, that's not very well known section, Briarwood. No, Wood. Briarwood is a, is a tiny community, and it's uh, big Victorian homes. We, we were just young and wanted a home, and we bought there. And then we, were, we started to have children, and we decided that we wanted to raise our children in a more beautiful place. So we moved out to East Hampton and built our own home out here. And then I realized, hmm, I, I guess I should get my studio going again. And so I started my own piano studio, which is now in my home in the village of East Hampton. So. That's amazing. I, shall I ask if your children play the piano? <laughs> they, they all uh, played around with the piano, but I believe that my children should go in their own direction. So my daughter ended up playing the flute as she was growing. And my middle son, he started with the trumpet. And my eldest son played the clarinet, but they all were given piano lessons. But their drive, their, their source of music. For me, music is the, the important thing. It's the, the instrument that you use to express it is, is a personal choice. So uh, my children are in other instruments, but they're all now independent and living around the country. So right now I'm an empty nester. So, uh, so maybe. The music stays with them, but maybe it's just a hobby. They don't make their living with it. No, they don't make their living. But I would say it would be hard for them to compete with you because you are so excellent on the piano. Yes, I still play and I still practice every day. You, know, and you do. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, this morning I put in a good two hours before I came here to. Wow. Well, I have a concert this Sunday. Um, the. Uh, there is a wonderful woman named Stephanie Barrios who put together a, a concert of high school and a little younger uh, students on the East End. And they're, they're all in love with classical music. And they're going to be That's doing That's rare. Yeah, and I think it's really wonderful that she has made this an important event that they would not put to the side like, oh, yeah, there's those classical musicians. But no, these are classical musicians who are getting together, and they're doing a fundraiser at Bay Street, and they're raising funds for Katie's Courage. And so these students... Um, What's Katie's Courage? Katie's Courage is a, uh, a nonprofit organization based on a little girl named Katie who lived and unfortunately died a few years ago of a serious uh, cancer in the liver. And she oh. took the hearts of everyone out here. She was a student of mine. She had oh. done all, my whole program. And uh, she adored music. And she adored horses. And she adored everything. She adored life. And she was just so inspiring that now this organization, as far as I know, they continue to support children who are going through such catastrophic illness. 
And so these children are going to share their music in a way that they're going to raise funds for this organization. I think that's really special. It is, it is. Yeah. Now I see you have this poster here, is, or a leaflet. Yes. I, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a brochure. It's a brochure, excuse my English. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to give this to you, and you want to talk about it and show it to well, the camera? Sure. What, what I do in my independent studio, one of the things that I uh, get here this way. Okay, how's that? Yeah. So one show of the, that okay, one mm -hmm. of the things that my, I wanted to create in my program was a place where children could come between the ages of birth through age six, where they could get a, a really firm grasp of music, that they would begin to create the fundamentals so that they could become musically literate. It was always my question as a young teacher to ask that question, how did children become musically literate? Although I didn't know how to ask the question when I was younger. I was just concerned that children didn't know how to read the printed page, and it really concerned me. It also concerned me that children seem to be disconnected from their musical past, what I would call the community of music that is part of our culture, that the children were not getting this anymore from their parents and their grandparents the way I had. So I decided that I would find a program that I could use in my studio where I could teach groups of children this, this connection back into music literacy and the repertoire that we've grown up with as children. So I've decided to uh, choose this program called Music Garden. And Music Garden provides appro age appropriate classes for babies, toddlers, preschoolers, elementary school, and beyond. And so I teach this in my studio in my home. And so this brochure is all about that. And is there anything inside that we should Well, talk the about? only thing, it, uh, what it will tell you is that um, when a child comes to do this program in my studio, they're going to be sharing this music with their, with their parents. And to me, that's part of a very important part of the training of a young child into music, that for a child to have a full musical experience, it needs to have a, a three-prong feeling. You need to have the child, obviously. You need to have the well-trained teacher. And that's mm -hmm. very important. And you need to have the parent who is encouraging this relationship between that well-trained teacher and the child. And that child needs to have that almost n sense that it's, it's totally natural that music is part of their lives. And out here on the East End, that is not something that happens often because the, the value system in our, on our East End is towards sports. Children are encouraged to the zenith on sports. And I think in some cases it goes beyond their academics. And I think music is a much more important part of a child's development. And I think it works in much more with their academic development. Because unlike sports, music is an eye, ear, hand coordination. And sports doesn't bring in the ear the way that music does. And so in the Music Garden curriculum, which this describes, it talks about how we bring all of the senses. We bring the whole child into the musical experience. So in my program, we will be dancing, we'll be drumming, we'll be singing, and we'll be applying all of those early musical literacy skills to an instrument, in my case, the piano. So what you're saying that uh, sometimes the parent, the mother comes to the class with the child? Absolutely, and when, they're, when they are uh, babies, the mothers, I'm, I'm training the mothers uh, how to share music with their babies. When they're mm -hmm. toddlers, I'm, I'm working with the parents to make it part of their every day. When they're preschoolers, they, the children begin to come to me for the first part, and then the parents come for family time. And that continues through my pre-piano program and my group piano program. So the parents are very much involved and I review the concepts, and I make sure they understand what, they, what to do at home. And then when they go home, my hope is that they continue this yeah. throughout the... And I've had, I've had some very, very good success with, with many of my students who are now... I've had many of my music garden graduates are now full-time piano students with me, and they're, they're 
you know, getting top spots in their musical events in school, and they're also doing NISMA. The thing I mentioned in the yeah. beginning, now they're going through those levels, and uh, one student of mine even won uh, a, a third place in a piano competition on Long Island, which was very exciting. That's must be very rewarding for you. Yeah, it's, a, it's fun to watch my studio begin to flower from these little tiny toddlers yes, who I've yes. known since they were babies, and now yeah. they're you know, almost as tall as me, and they're playing, <laughs> and they're doing duets with me, and it's, it's very rewarding. Yes. So. Did, did you ever get that, that somebody walks up to you and says hello to you, and you look at them, and you don't know who they are? Oh, yes. Because <laughs> Oh, I took a lesson with you when <laughs> when they were little, yeah. and and I'll, I'll remember the parent before I remember the child because yes. I, you know a three year old and a thirteen year old looks very different, yes. but they remember me, which yes. is kind of neat. And in fact, I had a I was teaching this at the Riverhead Music School for a brief time, and one child did come to me. He was going on to college for music, and he was thanking me because this was such an important part of his learning to fall in love with music. So although I'm a classical artist and a classically trained musician, I am aware that there, many of the children who come through aren't going to become classical oh, yes, pianists. Absolutely. They're going into <laughs> all fields. And, and uh, unfortunately, I don't know if you've heard, but just uh, recently we just, uh, we're mourning the passing of Hal McCusick, who just passed away on April 11th. And, Hal was one of the finest jazz pianist musicians player out here. And uh, he was 87. Uh. Um, and many of my students who wanted to study jazz would go to him. And I'm, I'm really very sad to hear that he is no longer Not with us. Yeah. And we used to kid each other and say, we're the only two, only two musicians out here. Because on the East End, one of the problems is for musicians, it's hard to make a living out here. Yes. And so unless you have some secondary income, um, most musicians who come out here cannot, cannot afford to stay. So they end up you know, moving back to New York. Or we get that influx in the summer of all the great musicians <laughs> coming out to their lovely little summer places. But they don't really share. They're not really sharing the music with the community, although they think they are. You know, they, 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 you know how it so is. So my next question is if, if you have a favorite musician, pian pianist. Oh, boy. Uh, right now, my, my favorite is Stephen Huff. Stephen Huff is an English pianist. And what I, I love about his playing, not only is he a formidable pianist, and, and in fact, he's going to be uh, at Carnegie Hall next year. And I'm going to make sure I go to hear him. I had heard him at Tanglewood a few years ago. Um, but he, he loves to explore the whole repertoire, not just the standard war horses. So I think he's now my, my favorite pianist of the time. Um, he's young, too, which I like. Well, I turned to Channel 13 last week. A friend of mine called me from New York to please watch this. And there was a <coughs> the San Francisco Philharmonic Orchestra that's uh -huh. supposed to be the most famous. Mm -hmm. And this young Chinese pianist was there, and he blew me away. Chinese pianist, do you remember his name? Yeah, his name is Lang Lang. Oh, you heard Long Long. Oh, Long Long. Yes, <laughs> yes. He's... Oh, I could not believe what I heard and saw. Yeah, he's not only a good player, but he's an actor. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's he's become quite an emissary, and he's talked about that how he is <clears throat> using the this sudden fame to bring music to his country and also to connect younger artists to piano. Um, he just announced last year that he was going to uh, learn the entire Iberian suite of Albanus. Now, I'm, I'm curious whether how far he's gotten, because he certainly has the facility. And that is, that is a very difficult piece. And I had learned the second, the second book of that last year. And I, I just know that he's, he's just filled with beauty when it comes to it. And so, yeah, he's, he's fun. And, you know, he's young. He's young. He has yeah, a lot of growing young. to do. Yes, yeah. yes. So well, some people are in awe of him. Yes. Some people 
criticize him for certain things. Well, because <laughs> he, he is a bit fast and superficial. But you know what? As like all musicians, you know, there's that young flame. Yes. And then they all, hopefully, they all grow and develop. You know, if, yeah. for me, the, my favorite pianist that is an older pianist would be Daniel Barenboim because he, I, I saw him at Carnegie uh, doing a master class of Beethoven sonatas, and there was a young boy in the, young, in the front row who asked him, how long have you been playing that piano sonata? And he turned to me and said, I've been playing it for 50 years. <laughs> and I knew exactly what, what Maestro Barenboim was saying, that th this music, we can learn the notes, but to learn the music really yes. takes a right. long time. And I'm always telling my students that, that, well, now you're learning the, yes. the music, you know, you're learning the notes and the rhythm, and you're getting... There's a uh, lot to learn there is to a start lot. with, you know. It's a life experience. So. And, uh, I, mean, I mean, even just for the beginner until they could play something there's a, oh, yeah. right, the right way, there's a lot to learn. So there's a lot of repetition in teaching. Oh, yes. But, uh, no, I, what was I going to say? Do you ever get students who <coughs> don't follow up on your instructions? <laughs> who they come because I I teach piano and from time to time and you know I go to, I said did you practice and I said no well, well okay you're right. gonna practice now. <laughs> well, we talk about uh, this idea of ideas that stick. That it's not so much about well yes it's assumed that they do consistent daily practice. And yes, there are plenty of students who, who don't, don't do, do consistent daily practice. Yes. However, every child that walks into my studio, they're walking in who they are at that moment. I take the music that they bring in with them, and I bring it one step forward. Yeah. And in that way, I'm not becoming the, did you practice today? Did you practice yeah. yesterday? Did you practice no. last <laughs> no, week? No, you can't do that. Because no. for a young yeah. child, they don't have that overall yes. view of where it's taking them. And so instead, I look for ways to create smaller goals. Yes. So in my group piano right. program, every five weeks, we have what is called a mini musicale. And ah. I've often had children walk in who have not played all week, and yet they want to play. And yes. so off they go playing, and, and that's fun. There's that spontaneity. But I also know that the discipline it takes for them to get to the point of practicing every day is a learned discipline, something that takes months and years with plenty of parental encouragement. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I, some children walk in fully prepared, and some children will walk in never having touched the instrument. Right. I just, yeah. I, I just reflect back to them, well, that's what it sounds like when you haven't practiced. Yes, it just, exactly. It's not going yeah. to improve. Right. And that's always, mm -hmm. that's why I tell them a lot about my practicing, that I'm, you know, I'll stay, well, right now I'm doing a, a project where I've decided I'm going to create a concert of all fantasies. Mm -hmm. So I've selected a, a Bach fantasy, a Mozart fantasy in C minor, a Chopin, the Chopin fantasy, the Schumann fantasy, and then I've so far picked the John Carulliano's fantasy etudes. And this is quite a program. So I put the music out and show the students, here's my project, and I've worked on this and this and this and this. And I tell them how I go about doing it. And that way they have a model from where, I mean, how can we teach if we don't do it ourselves? Uh -oh. It's a very important part. And uh, yeah, I'm part of a piano program, a piano foundation, where I'd say only about 30% of those teachers teach uh, to actually practice. And I just, I, I think that it is, it is the most inspiring thing for our children for them to know uh -huh. that you are willing to do it too, because it takes sacrifice and time. Yes, yes. And focus. And I, then I can give them all my ideas. Wow, when I practice this, I just mm. noticed this, this, and this. And I bet if you did that in your piece, that might work as well. Whereas if I sit back and say, well, I, you know, I haven't practiced, but gee, that's nice that you did. <laughs> that's just, yeah. that, that's sort of like um, someone trying to teach a great artist, but it doesn't do art themselves. You know? Yes. It's a funny thing. 
there's another very young Russian pianist, Konstantin. Oh, yes. Uh, what's his name? Shvita Shaklovsky. Yes, he really should change his name. Uh, <laughs> he, he lives, he was with Piano Fest. Yes, he and was. And he's really um, worked very hard to perform in the metropolitan area and Yes, locally. he did. Yes. Well, he was on my show when, was that last year or a lot of months ago? Yeah. And I enjoyed, I went to one of his uh, concerts. Yes, he's quite a showman. In, uh, Montauk. Yes, he is. He mm -hmm. is also. <laughs> so I enjoy pianists and I admire them. Yeah. And they a lot of times fun. when I hear, I said, I wish I could play like that. Uh -huh. But I don't practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's a matter of fact, one of my students' mother asked me before I gave the first lesson, it says, Can you play something? I said, I don't play. I only teach. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, you know, well, it's, it's a great okay. opening for you to, uh, to start go there. Playing. And yeah. I, I myself continue to take piano lessons oh, because... Well, I took a lot of lessons as an adult, yes. Right. So the, I think getting ourselves to that discipline is mm. so important. <clears throat> and I have many adult students as well who I give them a lot of credit for even walking in my door right. because they, uh, it can be embarrassing. Uh, what if they don't, what if they make an error? Uh, what if they do something silly at the keyboard? What if, there's a lot of what mm -hmm. ifs sitting at right next to me and I, I, have to, I have to become very friendly with them. I have to begin mm -hmm. to make them feel included. And, um, and at the same time, some of them are so inspiring when they come in yeah. and they can play something. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, you just did that. So that's very yes. exciting. Well, would you believe it? Uh, we came to the end of the show, and we could have talked for another half hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank all my underwriters. And this has been a wonderful show. Well, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure.